All right. What a year. I wanted to share a sacred episode with you. And I shared it purposely with you right before New Year's because I want you to hear. All right, everyone, we're going to dive in with Dr. Edith Edgar. She is a sought after clinical psychologist, a lecturer, helping individuals discard their limitations, discover their power of self renewal, and achieve things they previously thought unattainable. Dr. Edith Eager is a Holocaust survivor and a thriver. As a powerful analogy, she inspires people to tap into their full potential and shape their very best destinies. Her first book, The Choice, became a New York Times bestseller and beloved by Oprah and thousands of readers, uh, which details her experience as a Holocaust survivor and invites readers to join her in moving from recovery to discovery and beyond. And in her recently released book, The Gift, she offers a hands-on practical guide that encourages readers to change their thoughts and behaviors that may be keeping them imprisoned in the past. This was such a special conversation, and I am so honored that I had the privilege to have this conversation with Dr. Um, Edith. So let's dive in. And I really hope you gain value from this too. You can personally um, purchase any of her books from Amazon or wherever you buy books. The Gift is an amazing, amazing book. I listened to it on Audibles. And um, I want to know what you think. So text me, 313-710-5199. Let me know. Um, Or send me a DM on Instagram. I'm at Heather Chauvin. You can tag me as well. And if you are ready to get out of your own way and to rediscover, not rediscover, but step into who you want to be in 2021, um, I invite you to join our Get Out of Your Own Way mini course. You can, it's free. You can go to heatherchauvin.com forward slash workshop. Uh, You can actually find it on my website as well at heatherchauvin.com and register. And we're going to be going live. I'm going to be talking more about it on the podcast here um, and also on Instagram. So stay connected, listen, take action. And I truly do want to know the impact this conversation had on you. So reach out. Let's dive in. So thank you for that. I really, really appreciate it. And I'm just so grateful and excited to have this conversation with you. I actually posted one of your videos on online and said, what do you want to know? So I'm going to ask you questions from my community. And um, let's just dive in. So one of the first questions that everyone wants to know is about processing emotion. So you have so much wisdom, so much work that you've done. I've read your recent book. Um, oh, gift. geez. Yes, The Gift. It was right here. The Gift, uh, 12 Lessons to Save Your Life. And so many stories that you talk about in there, obviously people who have been through extreme trauma. So where do you even begin to start that conversation with people when they say, how do I even begin to start processing what is happening for me? Well, it's not what is happening, it's what we do with it. And emotion is energy. Energy, everything is energy. When it's been told that uh, emotion is energy in motion. And uh, I think what is important is to know that you cannot heal what you don't feel. So I think what you're doing is guiding people how to go through the journey of grieving, feeling, and healing. Do people and, uh, know? Go ahead. Yes, no, no. 
I was going to say, do people know what grief is? Because the traditional grief is loss of, of people. Yeah. yeah what does grief I, mean to I, you? It's, it's really, again, I, uh, I was speaking to a group of women and they were carrying the person who died. And this woman had a son who died at the age of 29. And so I asked her to look at it, that that spirit was sent to her for 29 years. And then that spirit went home. So you see, instead of concentrating and call it a loss, you know, life is not about lost and found. It's, it's, it's about celebrating what we still have here rather than what we lost. I give you an example on that because my sister was the pretty one in my family. She, she's alive and she still calls me and tells me she's gorgeous. Now, uh, when we were completely shaven in Auschwitz, she asked me, how do I look? And I had a choice then as you have a choice now to pay attention what she didn't have. There she was totally naked or totally shaven with a bald head. And I realized that I became her mirror. And instead of telling her how she looked, I said, Magda, you have beautiful eyes. And I didn't see it when you had your hair all over the place. Wow. So before you say anything, I ask yourself to really ask whether it's very important, very necessary, and most of all, is it kind? By the way, you have beautiful eyes. That's the first thing I notice. You have beautiful eyes. Oh, thank you. What about, um, do you think this was always inside of you? And did it come out when after you experienced the Holocaust, what was that, the choices that you make, did you know this before? Were you that person previously? And then it brought that to the surface for you. No, I really spent a lot of time alone because first of all, my mother told me, I'm glad that you have brains because you have no looks. Mm -hmm. And so Magda was the pretty one. My sister Clara was a child prodigy in violin. And my parents really wanted a son and I came along. So in Auschwitz, what I can tell you that the darker place that I was in, the closer I came to God. Mm -hmm. Because I discovered from within when nothing came from without. So if you depend on someone make you happy, I don't think you're ever gonna be happy until you give you before you give to others. Mm. So self-love is self-care. It's not narcissistic. I love that. <laughs> That's where I it hope you wake up in the morning. And you look in the mirror and say, I love me. Yeah. Yes. Looking back, what would you say? I'm obviously you're, you're over the years, the yeah. evolution of being able to process emotion. Mm -hmm. Do you still I fall back into, you know, when things are coming up for you? Because People say, how do I get over this? How do I get over this? Do you believe you ever get over things? No, I don't know that word. I don't get over it. I don't forget it. I came to terms with it. Mm. I call it my cherished wound. No, I don't run from it. I don't fight it. I think uh, the older I get, the more I am blessed that I am able to guide other people, not only surviving, but able to really be useful to other people. I never ask people, how can I help you? 
I, I, I ask, how can I be useful to you? Because I am not a healer, but I guide people in their own wonderful ways of being the precious one of a kind, authentic person that no one else can replace. Mm -hmm. So here I am again, just to see how you can accept yourself that you're good enough. Don't, don't, don't try to compare yourself with anyone else because there never was another me, you, and you know, not in a million years. Mm -hmm. So I live in a present. I think young, but I'm not young and foolish. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard you say yeah. that before. No, no, young and foolish. Uh, when a woman tells me, I have to find the right man, and I say, well, write down everything you want from the right man. Just start with I am, and then write down. You know, someone kind and, and so on. And so you become that person because the likelihood of you attracting what you dish out increases. So oh. see how you can, again, um, acknowledge that if you need another man, that's very negative because needs are things without which we cannot survive. We need to breathe. After four minutes, we, we've gone. We need to sleep because uh, after three days, we hallucinate. So don't, don't compare needs from wants. I want this and I want that. But if you need it, you know that is not really anything that is going to guide you to be a whole person in your own right. So life comes from inside out, not I will happy if, I will happy when, I will happy uh, when I find someone, no. You're as happy as you make up your mind this minute. So you don't need a man in your life right now? Absolutely, I don't need one. <laughs> I do have a, a friend and I like dancing and I uh, know that I, I think um, needs are negative, mm. negative um, because uh, if a man tells you, I need you, run. Run, that's the best advice ever. <laughs> so how do you, I wanna go back to connecting with God. Yes. When I was diagnosed, so previous to being diagnosed, I grew up Roman Catholic and I mm -hmm. had such a negative association with it. So then I created my own definition of God, universe, source um, mm -hmm. that felt comfortable to me and learning a lot. And I remember the night I was diagnosed, I walked out of the hospital and I looked up and I said, you finally have my attention. And I didn't know why I said that. So when someone says it's in those moments when you're connected to God, how do we know? How do we know what that connection is? It's not in your body and your mind. It's your third dimension, the spirit. And I think that's the best voice you can ever think of that you're awake, you're awake, you're aware, and you can turn anything into an opportunity for growth. Mm -hmm. So I like Tinkerbell because Tinkerbell is, uh, is the free spirit uh, that guided me in Auschwitz how to turn hatred into pity. Mm. And I began to feel sorry for the guards. And if I would have died, you would have found me there praying for the guards. Mm. 
-hmm. and turning hatred into pity. Can you tell me more about that? How you can see the hatred and turn it into pity? I, I, I think, I think hatred um, is the other side of love. You know, there is no love without hate. There is no life without death. You see, there is no summer without winter. You got to look at the polarities. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the most wonderful. Um, mentors um, was telling me um, that um, always look at both sides of everything. So I am also a Libra <laughs> and I put everything on a scale on the one hand, on the other hand, but Abraham Maslow was the one who was telling me, and he created his theory, how to go through and to become self-actualized, you know, and they, it was so true that when we were hungry, all we talked about was food, yeah. all we were talked about. And, and when our belly is, is full, then we look for safety needs. And then when we are, safe and we are full with food, then we look for the love needs, he calls it. Mm -hmm. And then he calls it and the belonging. So love and lo belonging is very, very important to look at. But yeah. most people, they look at the belongings to another person to be, I like you to be congruent and see what your head is telling you, what your body is telling you. I cannot change your genes. There are your genes that is the environment. And I look at the third possible way, how to respond to the other two. And I differentiate between reacting or responding because when you react, you don't think. And I, especially in school, I tell children, to read the Karate Kid because the best power is brain power. So I keep, keep preaching a little bit about not to smoke pot because it interferes with your natural growth of your brain. Mm -hmm. And we too often, you know, the essence of why I started this podcast was because yes. I externally wanted to control right? Mom is in control. I wanted to control my children's behavior. I wanted to control everybody around me. And every single time I was learning something else, it comes back to self, yes. to self. If you come to one of my lectures and I speak to a big group of people about parenting, I pick someone from the audience and I say to the audience, when I want to control my child, and if my child is slow, my child is a, 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 a turtle, and I am a rabbit. Mm -hmm. So what I do, I start pushing my child so that child would go faster. That's not really good mothering because you want your child to be the kind of a child that you would feel like a good mother. Yeah. And uh, that's not taking care of the child's need. So, uh, and if it's the other way around, I know the child is faster and you are slower, then you try to slow down the child. Either way, you want to know in how to pick up the rhythm of that child and meet that child there. So you don't treat the child many times in any other way by not really trying to push or pull, but meet them where they are and treat them and meet yeah. them where they are. And the person who was very good at that was Jesus. You see, he, I think Jesus knew 
how not to talk to a four-year-old and talk about cognitive dissonance, you, you know, mm -hmm. might meet them as, sounds like you said about that, sounds like you met, you know, that, that you go to the feeling part. See, men want to understand everything. Remember that? Why? Because they're, they have a different corpus callosum as we do. That's why we call men thick-headed. You know? <laughs> they want to understand. And I go to the compassionate listening and meet the feeling, the feeling part, mm -hmm. the healing part. And of course, to be a good parent to you, that also means that you look at anything in life as an opportunity, for an opportunity. Yeah. Because I discovered in Auschwitz that the Nazis could throw me in a gas chamber. We never knew what's going to happen next. We didn't know whether we took a shower, whether uh, water or gas is going to come out. They could throw me in a gas chamber and they could torture me and beat me and never ever could touch my spirit. Mm. So you see, and that's what you're teaching, mm -hmm. that you're not running from reality. And you know, you know that you choose to do all you can to be a good role model because children don't do what we say, they do what they see. Mm. So I want to congratulate you, mommy, that you are truly a wonderful, wonderful role model Thank you. to all of us. I'm not so going to be able happened? to get through this without crying. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> crying is very good because yeah. what comes out of your body is the best thing you can do. You have a good cry. You feel better. Mm -hmm. So do not hold. You know, in America, people want to control themselves. It's a real Anglo-Saxon way of thinking. I'm Hungarian, you know, we scream, okay, you know. <laughs> so Noise go is good. Yeah, yes, crying is very good. It's healing. What comes out of your body doesn't make you ill. What stays in there does. Mm -hmm. I have definitely learned that along my journey. Um, and someone actually mm -hmm. asked that question of, do you, do you feel that trauma or what you know of trauma is attached to physical ailments and disease and what we're seeing um, culturally happen? I think our stomach is associated with our brain and some things you just can't stomach like another person. <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I I think it's very important not to do anything in excess. And what people do that I hope they get rid of. And one is guilt. What I could have done and should have done. And one is in the future is worry. Get rid of guilt and worry. So if you have guilt, there is just one sentence you need to tell yourself that if you knew then what you know now, obviously my parents had tickets to come to America, but we didn't know about Auschwitz at mm -hmm. all, mm -hmm. never. And to, to, to forgive myself, I had to go back to Auschwitz. I had to go back to the lions then and look at the lion in the face. You got to have rage. You got to go through the ridge. You go through the valley of the shadow of death, but don't come there. Don't set up household there. Mm. See, that's what we do. We get addicted to that anger, but that anger is hurting us. I am very selective. Who is going to get my anger? Mm. I don't think personally in the English language, if someone is going to, start any sentence with you, you this and you that, 
you know you're going to be dumped on. And yeah. you say to yourself, the longer they talk, the more relaxed I become. So you take the negative stimuli and you turn it into positive because you're practicing your low frustration tolerance level. I love that. See? Do you think yeah. healing ever ends? I, I think it's lifelong um, uh, growing and climbing the mountain, sleeping and climbing and never stop climbing. Mm -hmm. I have yet to arrive. And uh, my daughter calls it EDisms. Are you revolving or are you evolving? Mm -hmm. Some people work very hard to go nowhere, like, uh, like um, whatever in a wonderland. Who is in a wonderland? Alice in Wonderland. Alice, Alice in a wonderland, yeah. Alice, yes, yeah. Alice in Wonderland. Just keep going yeah, around and around. Around and around, like a merry-go-round, and no end inside. I like the idea of keep walking and uh, stop and see whether you are following an arrow. I like to call it an arrow. You may call it a goal. Have a goal and see whether you are on that road that will lead you closer to the goal. I love that. When I came to America, I came from Germany to, to New York. But there was a big storm, and I could see that we were turning somewhere. But we didn't stay there, because he knew you got to go to New York. And so sometimes we have to um, take a different route, as long as we don't get stuck in there. And anger can really keep us hostage, yeah. hostage and prisoner of the past. I don't live in Auschwitz. I love that. I live so, in a present. You've said that three times. You've said that multiple times. I live in the present. I live in the present. What does so that I, mean to you? Just let me finish what I started with a 29 year old um, son. Mm -hmm. I taught the mother to really be sure that she has a choice of concentrating that that spirit came to her for 29 years, mm -hmm. rather than talking about losing. And that spirit went home because I think the people who are not with us anymore, and I know my parents died in Auschwitz the first day in a gas chamber, I owe it to them to let people know. Mm. You know, I owe it to them and to celebrate their lives and let people know what happens when good people, good people, because we're good, we're born with joy, we're born with love, we're good people, we learn to hate. Mm. We learn to judge other people and the us and them mentality. You know, I get the New York Times every day, and I was reading uh, what's happening in Germany again. It's kind of, you know, painful to look at the white supremacy group and how they are growing. And uh, what can we do about that? Uh, but there is a Hitler in every one of us, and so is goodness and kindness. Mother Teresa told us that that uh, we can only handle what God gives us. Yeah. And then she looked up and said, God, why do you love me so much? <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's very precious. You know, sometimes, sometimes we, we are carrying a little too much. Yeah. So don't I... be a perfectionist. Don't be a perfectionist and give up the need for the approval of others and give up your perfectionism because you're human. Yeah. You're going to make mistakes. It's okay. Yeah. And I think it's very important to give up perfectionism. We need to get rid of it. It's getting in our way from becoming 
present. Mm -hmm. They're becoming yes, home. To be human. Yeah. 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 It fell about it. What was your motivation behind writing the gift? Did you feel the pull? Did you feel it? Or you're like, dang it, I got to write another book. Well, I, I was asked to write many, many, many times to, read, to write the book. And my answer was, I have nothing to say. Mm. But then Philip Zimbardo from Stanford told me that people who survived and famous are all men, and they need a female voice mm -hmm. that did it for me. And after the choice, I kept reading, you need another book, I, don't, I need a more practical book. Mm -hmm. And that's how the gift came about. Beautiful. I've been listening to it on Audible. It is, I, I put it on all the time. And when I need a little pick me up or um, perspective shift, it's, it's amazing. It's practical. It's an easy read as well. And you are the one who is going to be uh, uh, having wonderful children who listen to you now and carrying your word and carry the legacy that you don't give up ever. Mm. And you find hope in hopelessness. And that's what you and I are all about. But to be realistic, not idealistic. You know, it's okay to dream, but don't, don't mix your romanticism with realism. Mm -hmm. You go see your doctor, you get the shots, you, you know what to do in the morning, that you eat properly, and you see, mm -hmm. you, you, you have a healthy adult in you, and your little girl inside, you may be crying because you may be too busy. And so you got to look at that little girl and tell her, I'm not, I'm a good mommy to you and see how you can really be as congruent as you can be, your body, mind, and spirit, and you working, loving, and playing. Mm. Why is this, why was it so important to you? Or what do you say to women today who say, I don't need to tell my story. I don't, you know, it's been said before. I'm really not that important. Um, what do you say to a woman like that? I'm going to tell them that I'm 93 years old and I have seven great grandsons and my book is on the living room table. That's how. Mm. And they carry your blood. They carry your blood, you owe it to them. You will never, ever regret that. Mm. So stop writing and just get it out. Just shake it out like a mop from your head down, okay? You know, I have a wonderful uh, person who helps me now, and uh, she's my assistant, and her husband was unfortunately uh, diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. And so her daughter is here with me, and I encourage her to cry and acknowledge that half of her is her father's blood. Mm. And, and so uh, it's okay to grieve. All therapy is actually not what happened, but what didn't happen. Mm. When, my, when my granddaughter asked me to buy her a dress so she can go to the bishop school for her dance, and I came home and out of the blue, I was crying. I didn't understand what am I crying about? And then I realized that not because I bought Lindsay a dress so she can go to her dance. I cried because I never went to a dance. Mm. That's why I want to encourage that person. It's not the story, it's what you do with that story. 
what, what you did with that story, because it's easier to die than to live. I was very suicidal after the war because reality hit me. My parents are not coming back. My boyfriend was killed a day before liberation. And he's the one who told me, I have beautiful eyes and beautiful hands. And that's what kept me alive in Auschwitz. I would ask everyone, tell me about my eyes. Because if I survive today, I'm going to look at my boyfriend and show him my eyes and my hands. So I'm very, very grateful that you and I met. And I hope to be a good role model to you to keep walking. And uh, also, one of my other idiosyncrasies is that the opposite of depression is expression. Mm. To keep talking, to keep being, hopefully, the wonderful role model to every woman to know that what is good is to become emotionally and financially independent. Amen. So you, you want to be a baby or a big girl? Because while you are a baby, you sit in the back of the car and you mess around when your mother is driving. Yes. But now, do you want to be driven or do you want to be the driver? Mm. So I highly recommend children to stay in school as long as you can, as long as you get, can afford it. Um, but my name is Dr. Edith Eva Eager, and I didn't speak any word of English when I came to America, and I graduated with honors, so I am very much pushing education and brain power, yes. I love it. Yes, um, and a lifelong learner. I'm sure you're still learning today. I love learning. I'm reading all the Brené Brown's books now over again because I was invited to her program in January. Yes, and, and uh, I am so grateful to her, what she does, the way she does it. She is a professor and she is also doing a lot of research. Um, and so I am just so happy. And both of us were on Oprah. And uh, so I am so grateful for every moment. Life is full of surprises. Mm -hmm. And if something is happening, you can't, especially now, you don't have to like being locked in. You can say, I don't like it, it's inconvenient, and it's temporary, and I can survive it. Yeah. So it's a yes and, not a yes but. Yeah. Given the but, I give you an and. I love Everything that. is temporary. Everything is temporary. So what is on your plate for 2021? Where can people find you? Lectures, online, books, um, I courses? I love Zoom. I love Zoom. You know, you don't I have to leave the. You don't have to leave your house. Yes, I don't have to. I can wear my nightgown and just a pretty, pretty scarf. Doctor Edith, thank you so much for being here. Um, you okay. are a gift, and I am just incredibly yeah. grateful for your time, your energy, your dedication you. to thriving. You're gonna we're going to send you this uh, to be a survivor and not a victim. Okay? Perfect. And we will post that in the show notes and share with everybody. Yes. So I want to thank you for continuing and uh, living to be 120 like Moses. Oh, boy. That is a big, <laughs> that's a big ask. <laughs> thank you. I... I'm committed to this path and this journey and, um, you know, putting this one book out into the world. I'm excited to see where it takes. And I, I take, um, yeah, the power of women and community very um, personally. Thank so you. I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, have a beautiful day. So you live in New York? I live in La Jolla, California. Ooh, beautiful. I live in paradise. Beautiful. I've never been, but I know a few people that live there. It's very beautiful. I have an ocean view in the front and a canyon view in the back. I am the luckiest, more, more wonderfully filled with gratitude. Mm. Nothing but gratitude. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, I love to be with family. Thank you so much, you as well, and have a beautiful holiday. Thank you. I will.